All right, let me go ahead and pray. Father, thank you for this evening. Thank you for Ron and Father, just how much he has grown. Thank you for the investment he's made in so many men's lives, Father, including my own. Thank you for the growth and the impact that he's having on generations. I pray tonight that uh, I would honor him through his story, first of all. And second of all, Father, I pray that uh, everybody that watches this would be honored. And I pray this in your name. Amen. 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 So I want to make sure that everybody's on mute. Well, good evening, everybody. I, uh, Ron and I just felt like we have a great opportunity here before Christmas to give everybody a Christmas present, just in terms of a picture of their future. If they stick with doing the hard work, because we realize how hard the work is in Change University, we realize how deep, how deep the pain is. Every single one of us has been there. And sometimes it's hard to see the fruit of your actions. Sometimes you just want to give up and numb the pain. I know that I've done it. I've been there. Everybody's been there. But Ron, uh, everybody knows Ron. Ron is Ron's a man that has chosen not to do that, to do the very, very difficult work. And he, shared, he and I were having a one-on-one -on -one talk a couple of weeks ago, and he shared, he shared a story about kind of a season that he's been going through and some of the decisions that he made that really blessed me. And I said, hey, Ron, what would you think of sharing this with everybody else? So that's what we're here for. So Ron, <laughs> first of all, thank you for your investment in me, in Change University, in all of the lives of all of the men here and all of the coaches, in you know the very large Facebook group. So many people have been so impacted by you, Ron. So thank you so much. Well, thank you, David, for recognizing it. Um, it's just... Uh just trying to be obedient to the Lord. You know, I mean, he's put this passion in my heart and I'm just trying to, to respond obediently to it and be faithful. Yeah. So, um, for the guy, just for the guys here, Ron, um, you and I actually met when, before you were divorced at a yeah. church in Manson. I didn't, re I didn't remember that you reminded me of that kind of interesting, right? So kind of go back just for the guys in time and tell us how many years were you married what did you do and what made you decide to move to Manson, small town of Manson? Well, um, we were married 30 years. We've got two boys. Uh, they're in their, our sons are in the 30s. One's 31, the other's 33. Uh, I've got two grandsons. One's three and the other one just turned one. And um, so I came out of a 30 year marriage. I was living over in the, uh, what called the general Seattle area. It's actually up in an area called Edmonds, which is just north of Seattle. Um, and I was a home builder. I built houses for many years over there. Um, did some commercial work, some multi multifamily. Uh, but the most of my latest activity over there when I was there was building homes. Uh, had my own business. Always, I've, I've been in business kind of for myself for since about 1993. So. Uh, and I just love being my own uh, boss and so on. I had said to myself, I'm only going to work for one more jerk in my life. And that's going to be me. Right. <laughs> um, so I, I love the freedom of that. Um, the flexibility of it. Um, it's just gives me the ability to pick and choose what I want to do and who I want to work for. And, uh, and so we bought a property over here in Eastern Washington and Damon has a house actually within a mile from me here um, that he had bought subsequently, but we had bought a property over here as a vacation property. And I had a house that kept coming back and forth and using. And every time I came over here to use it, I was working on it. And I was ah. like, <laughs> I'm like, you know, this is not my idea of vacation, right? I come over here. I got a sprinkler system that's gone sideways. I've got this that needs to be fixed. That needs to be fixed. And I'm thinking to myself, I can't be the only person in the world that has a second home that has the same frustration. So when the real estate market kind of crashed in about 2008, um, I had about eight houses going over a million and a half in debt. And I was mm. I was scrambling, guys. I was literally just working night and day just to get out from underneath all that um, and not lose, you know, lose everything. Um, it was a very stressful time. And 
I managed to work through that inventory, got rid of it, uh, came out, you know, still financially viable, survivable. Um, and then it was like, what do I do next, right? Because uh, the, the market had changed. I wasn't going to go back into building houses again. It was too stressful. It was too much um, tension, um, too much risk. You know, the market can change so quickly. And um, I kept thinking and thinking and thinking. I'm like, well, I loved it over here. I love being near the lake. I love the small town feel. I love the political climate here versus where I was in the Seattle area. Um, I knew a lot of people here because I had been involved with the business community and volunteering and doing things when I was here. Um, so we came over, it was about 2012. Yeah, it was about, I think about 2012, we came over full time. And, uh, and then I started this business, uh, it's called Home Watch, Lake Chelan Home Watch. And I just started helping people with their homes, vacation homes, basically doing what I was doing for my own home, but taking the burden off people so that they could come over here and enjoy their homes and not be working on them. Um, and then some of that morphed into, uh, kind of added another feature to the business, which was handling private vacation home rentals for people where they were renting their own homes out and they, but they needed someone locally to kind of handle anything that came up with the home. Um, and so that's a part of my business. And, and then the other part of it is just a steady stream of clients that I just do regular uh, home watch stuff with. And, uh, and a lot of it's home maintenance and, and stuff that comes up too on the homes. So that's kind of the genesis of where we were, where I was, and where we came over here. And then about after a couple of years here, the ex decided that she didn't really want to be here and she didn't want to be married anymore. So um, wow. her, her choices were, she, her, one of her big reasons with going back presumably was so she could spend more time with the kids because she figured uh, that, you know, they were going to get married. Um, Ryan especially was the oldest and then there'd be grandchildren. And, and she was making those noises about the first time we landed here. And I, I looked at her and I go, we had a long discussion. You know, we had a long discussion about making this move and, you know, she was all for it. And then when she got here, she just, um, I don't know, you know, I think a lot of it was she'd been used to working for me when I was building houses. She had a lot of freedom. Mm -hmm. And when we got, and when we got here, she had to then essentially work for some other people because I was starting a business again, right? Starting a business from scratch. Um, and it takes a while to do that. It takes a while to build a business, and make it self-supporting. Um, so I think that was difficult for her. Um, she didn't have all her friends. Uh, she obviously didn't have her, her boys around. Um, we were making trips over like once a month to at least see the boys and do that. But she was not happy. She was just not happy for a lot of reasons. Um, and, and there were marriage struggles as well. So, so anyhow, in about 2014, yeah, about 2014, she left. Um, and it was like a tidal wave. You know, I was like trying to build a business. Um, she'd left. And then my dad passed away. Oh, oh, uh, Ron. Yeah. So all that kind of happened. Um, that was all kind of coming on top of me all at the same time. And, uh, you know, and it was just like, I had to make some choices. I had to make some choices whether I could fall into depression or just keep moving forward. Um, and I just chose to kind of rise above it and keep moving forward. And, um, you so Ron, know, can, I, can I interrupt you just for a sec? Because I think this is, important, this is an important point in the story. Yeah. Um, yeah. So you lived in Seattle. You had a large community of friends, I'm sure. And you had people that you knew and a support network. And then you moved over there with a dream yep. of retiring with your wife and enjoying life for, this, for the rest of your life. You were mm, late 50s when that happened, right, Ron? Yeah. And now you find yourself... In this small town, and just for everybody's reference, Manson has no stoplights. One, I'm sorry, there's one stoplight, right? No, I don't think there's any stoplights. No stoplights. One, one grocery store, uh, one gas station, and you're lucky if you can find a restaurant open in the wintertime. 
there's like it's like there's nobody in manson nobody whatsoever it's beautiful but there's nobody there and so you find yourself transplanted in this place your wife says she wants a divorce your kid your sons are living in eastern washington or western you have, washington. in western washington you you have no support network your dad dies you are literally all alone yeah all alone completely alone so what'd you do did you go get yourself a girlfriend and numb the pain run nope um, why not I'd... why not why not that'd be the normal thing to do you know, um, yeah, that would be the normal thing to do. Um, but I had resolved in my head that I would never be involved in another relationship again that was not the right relationship, right? Uh, I, and that was a decision that I had made. I'd learned, learned from the, a lot of stuff from this process. And I just knew that, I mean, there was a couple of women that I dated off and on, but you know, I just sat back and I said, it's not the right time. Uh, I, there's a lot of things I need to work on myself. Um, I need to heal. Um, and I, I just need to know what it is I'm looking for. So I think that was the, that was really the, the decision points for me. And, um, and that, that's kind of where I ended up where I, where I am. Um, it is, it is a small town. Uh, there are more restaurants open in the winter than they used to be. It's getting better, but two, it's still three, yeah, <laughs> yeah, two or three. But you know, it's getting better than it was. Um, and I, one of the things I did intentionally do is I plugged myself into a men's group, right? Ah. I found a church. I plugged into a church, and then I found a men's group to plug into because I needed, I needed just to be surrounded by some guys that could help walk me through the pain and uh, this was before you know change you obviously um, and I just you know knew I just knew in my heart that that's what I needed to do um, and so I did I plugged into a men's group and uh, unfortunately most of the guys there didn't really understand what it is to be a divorced single man you know they were all married guys um, I think maybe one, one may have gone, one or two had gone through a divorce, but it had been many years ago. They'd been remarried. So they really weren't very empathetic, you know, um, because they weren't, they, it wasn't something they were really intimately familiar with, or they had forgotten because it'd been so long. So, so Ron, that, so it, it was just about that time. And I want to make sure that we capture this. So I don't forget it. It was just about that time that, you didn't we had met once at church so we didn't really know each other i mean we hadn't communicated anything and it was 2015 i got laid off from microsoft and i was inspired and i i wrote this book right that's where i was getting up i apologize for getting up but i wrote this book many of you may recognize it i had just i had literally just finished the last chapter and i got an email from a friend of mine, Jeff in Manson. And he said, you know, Damon, I know, I know you're writing this book. I've seen your blogs. Would you mind sharing an early copy? I've got a guy in my group that's going through divorce. And I said, yeah, sure. I'll share an early copy, not knowing what to think. And I, I emailed it off to this guy by the name of Ron. Didn't, rem didn't remember when I emailed you that we had talked, but I emailed you my book. And I remember a couple of weeks later, a month later, you said, thank you so much. This is so helpful to me. And you know, it's just a painful journey. And I had no idea when I wrote that, that this was going to happen, <laughs> right? I had no idea who you were, that the Lord would put us together and we'd build this thing called change. No idea whatsoever, right? No. no. Well, and I don't think you even sent, you didn't even send me the book originally. You didn't have no, the book. I didn't have you the book. Had, you had a PDF, I think, or manuscript, kind of rough manuscript, was still rough draft. And yeah. that's what you you originally sent to me so it was the book was still pretty raw and fresh right yeah, yeah for sure so um so here you are and you and like you're still in this situation and you're you've made this resolve that you're not going to get in another relationship until you're healthy and whole and solid yep. and somewhere along that time ron 
your your relationship with the Lord switched, right? And you made some really huge decisions that I want all these guys to hear because they don't they may not know this about you, but you made some huge decisions. And then I'll go into those just a little bit. So you want to kind of just walk us through that journey of how, you getting closer to the Lord, your your relationship and well, you know, I, I really started thinking about, you know, and it was it was kind of funny because these are a lot of things that we've incorporated, obviously, in Change University, but these are things I was kind of like just doing on my own way before Change University, and before I was connected with Change University. But one of the things was spiritual, kind of these spiritual disciplines, right, which was being in the word, um, you know, digging deep, Um being involved in volunteering and helping, I actually started a divorce care group uh, through a church. I was the leader for that, uh, helping other people in that respect. Um, and then uh, one of the one of the critical things I did is I turned off the TV. You know, I just said there's too much garbage coming in off the TV, too much negative stuff. It was like I'm going to start filling my head with different messages, positive stuff, you know, scripture, sermons, uh, reading Bible, reading books, uh, reading things that would, you know, help me grow as, you know, uh, a person, a, a husband, former husband, or even future husband, and, and an ongoing father, grandfather. Um, so it was like, if I'm going to invest in myself, I'm going to invest in myself. I'm not going to, you know, it's the old garbage in garbage out, you know, <laughs> the stuff coming, the stuff, stuff coming across the TV and through most of the other sources of media out there were just negative, you know? And I said, I don't need any more negativity in my life. Um, I need to fill my, my life uh, with positive stuff. And, um, and so I just developed a real passion for, uh, the Lord and his word and being obedient, being faithful, um, just trying to walk in that spirit, right? I think that's that's the, the takeaway for me is to walk in the spirit, you know, to love like Christ and to try to be like God, right? And so, Ron, so Ron before that time, I mean, just honest, honestly, how much time did you vote, devote to being listen to these podcasts and listen to these sermons and being in your Bible and stuff Bef before that decision. Now it's three, four, five hours a day, I think is what you told me. Right. <clears throat> well, before, I mean, it was not, almost nothing, right. Almost uh, nothing. Almost yeah. nothing. Yeah. And when I got on, when I finally started getting a passion for the word and the Lord, I was, I was hungry. I, you know, I mean, you couldn't, I couldn't satiate the appetite, you know, it was just like, uh, anything I could come across, I was listening to. I, I probably have, I don't know, maybe seven or eight uh, podcasts that I kind of ratchet through even to this day. Uh, that I was trying to filter stuff out, stuff that really spoke to my spirit, stuff that didn't. So I went through a lot of stuff to find things that, that helped me. Um, and, you know, I've come across, you know, guys like John MacArthur, right? And, uh -huh. Uh, and a couple other uh, powerful pastors. And, you know, those are resources, obviously, I've shared with many, many of the other guys in the, in the program here. And I've seen the fruit of the benefit that is produced for them as well. Um, so, but it took me going through kind of that journey, you know, to figure it out. And, and I was fortunate in some respects because my brother is, a, is an associate pastor for a church down in um, California. And so, you know, he's been a good resource to reach out to and talk, talk about some different things. And we've had lots of long conversations. In fact, he, he actually called me last night and he was talking to me about this very same thing we're talking about today. And he shared some stuff. I'll, I can share a, a little anecdote later on how that's impacted him and, and his ministry, which I didn't even know. I mean, he shared with me yesterday something that was profound. But so, so let me, so I, I want to, there's a reason why I wanted to share this particular part, um, because many of you have heard me say your system is perfectly designed to give you the results that you're getting. You've also heard me say at various points in the coursework that um, uh, we are what we repeatedly do. 
excellence then is not an act, but a habit. You've heard me refer and the H in change stands for habits, right? We've talked about a lot of this kind of stuff and many of you may have completely forgotten it because I just, I rarely mention it. It's very, very brief. But I've realized with my own life recently and reflecting on things that that statement, if, if you wanna know the person that you're gonna be in five years, it's really, really simple. Show me the people that you spend time with and the books you read slash podcasts you listen to, et cetera, right? It's those two things. Now it seems really, really simple folks. I know it seems really, really simple conceptually, but if I could just beg you, implore you to make a couple of simple changes in the decision that Ron made, make the decision that you are gonna choose the people that you associate with wisely. Choose wisely because you will become them. And make a decision that with your spare time, you are going to fill your head with books and podcasts and things that will build you up and edify and help you to grow. Because you will become a completely different person because of that stuff. Okay, I just rereading the book, that The Power or um, Atomic Habits, he talks about it. It's fascinating. So, so Ron, so you've been doing this for what, five, five years, right? Well, she left in, yeah, she left in 2014. So I wasn't shortly after that before I started, um, you know, trying some different things and Six trying years. to, yeah, just, you know, reaching out there and doing some things on my own, trying to see what would work. And so it's, yeah, six years or so. So I want to fast forward here to the, to kind of the, to kind of get to the punchline. We'll go back and get some detail because this is what really resonated with us. So, um, so and you, you've remained steadfast. You've poured into Change University. You've poured into these men. You've just remained absolutely steadfast to this thing. And, and you have no ability to see how much you changed, do you, Ron? I mean, it's a, it's a slow, tiny, little gradual change every day. So you, so you reflecting back to 2014, is, it's kind of hard to remember who you were, isn't it? Yeah, it is. So sometimes, sometimes we get an opportunity to have a glimpse of um, who we were and what we become. And I just wanna, I know you know this, Ron, but I wanna make sure that we, we always wanna honor our ex-wife in these recordings and everything. So um, so we fast forward and, and your ex-wife made a choice to, to remarry, correct? Yep. And I, that, had, that had, correct me if I'm wrong, but Ron, if I'm wrong, Ron, but how was that? How did that feel when she remarried? Because you made it because because for everybody's reference, Ron stood the line of reconciliation before the before the word stand on the line of reconciliation was even understood. Ron right. made a decision. I'm going to stand. Right. 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 Yeah, yeah, that was the key. You know, I, I wanted to demonstrate to my boys that we don't walk away. Right. That when the going gets tough, you just get tougher and you, you know, you stand there and you wait and you do what needs to be done. Um, it was about, for me, it was about leaving a legacy uh, for my boys, um, you know, just trying to do the right thing, right? We talk about, there's, no, there's nothing wrong about trying to do the right thing. Yeah, it's um, never wrong to do the right thing. Right? And so that was my focus was trying to do the right thing. And, uh, you know, so it hurt. I mean, it was painful. It was very painful. Um, this other man came into the picture and... It was a it was a gut blow, guys. I, I'm not going to say it wasn't. It wasn't anything I expected. I I figured that I prayed hard. I figured the Lord was going to restore the marriage, and you know. And then I found out this other man was in the picture, and um, and then you know it was just it was hard. It was hard to hear. And then I didn't even know they were engaged until well, it was kind of ironic. I was my it was a couple of years. I was couple of years ago, I guess, because my, when my oldest grandson was turning one, they were going to have a birthday party for him. And my son invited me and um, he, he was, I guess, somehow he and his mother, my ex got into some argument and apparently she was engaged and I didn't know. Okay. And mm. my, my son was, didn't want to be the one to tell me because he didn't really want to, he didn't want to hurt me anymore. You know, he knew how much I, uh, pain I was in. He didn't want to be the one to bear the bad news. Right. And so 
when this uh, party was coming up for my first grandson, my son was like, well, you need to tell, he, she, he was, it was, it's funny because my son was putting the monkey on her back, which I thought was pretty interesting, but he, he put the monkey on her back to say, you need to call dad. You need to tell him that you're engaged. You need to tell him what you want to do. Cause what she wanted to do at that point in time was to bring this new man who is she was engaged with to the birthday party for the first grandson. And, um, and my son said, I'm not going to allow that to happen unless dad is comfortable with it. Right. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Wow. <clears throat> Way so, to go. See that, see, that's so, a reflection of you, Ron, and how they see you setting firm boundaries and being commitment. They're, they're, they're doing what you do, right. They're honoring you. Yeah. So my wow. son, wow. My, my son and daughter-in-law honored me in this whole thing, which was huge. You know, I mean, um, and they, they basically told her, look, you know, you're not married to this guy. We don't know this guy. We want to keep this as intimate, just an intimate family thing. Um, so you're welcome to come down. He, they told her you're welcome to come down, but we just don't feel comfortable with, with him being here. And, and unless, unless Ron wants to, is comfortable with it. And I said, I'm not comfortable with it. Um, you know, I don't know if this guy is going to be around in the long term. And I just really don't want to see my grandkids uh, and exposed to him uh, unless I know that this is going to be a longer term deal. So, so she was, she put on a, she, she had a kind of a temper tantrum, but she eventually came down on her own. Um, and it was a good party. I mean, we had a, we had a good time. Uh, everything went well. Um, so, so that was kind of, that was kind of interesting. And it's now reflecting on it, thinking about everything is kind of revolved around two, two, birthday parties two one-year-old birthday parties. oh isn't that interesting <laughs> right As, that you just had that aha didn't you yeah i just had an aha moment <laughs> that, you know it's it, these these have been the pinnacle moments that have put me in these different seasons of of pain right yeah. different seasons of pain so the first one i dodged the bullet basically you know i dodged the pain because my son put a boundary on um, and they let me be in control of the situation. And, you know, I just said, no, I, I'm not comfortable with it. So, um, but now my second son has gotten engaged here. Oh, a few months ago. And, and I knew that eventually I'm going to have to face this situation. Right. Um, you know, I figured it was going to be next August when my son gets married and uh and i i felt well it's gonna be a safer environment for me because it's a bigger group of people you know i'm not going to have to have a lot of direct interaction you know with this new man in her life and so i was like ah, i can probably negotiate that and my youngest son was getting really anxious about it all and he called me up one night and he goes, yeah, I don't know, dad, uh, do I need to plan different events here? And, you know, and I'm like, no, this is not your problem. I said, this is not your problem. It's not your concern. This is my issue. I'm going to work through it. Right. Uh, so I took ownership of it. I wasn't going to put it on him. And then, so anyway, this, my youngest grandson just turned one here um, last week. Um, so I got an invitation from my daughter-in-law to come over for the birthday party. And, uh, and I was assuming that, you know, the ex wasn't going to be there because there hadn't been any real contact and communication with them for the whole year. Um, in fact, my ex hadn't even seen the new grandson since he'd been born. So it'd been a whole year. Um, so I assumed that she wasn't even going to be there. And well, then a few days after the invitation, I get another text from my daughter-in-law saying, Oh, uh, by the way, I don't want you to be caught off guard, but, um, you know, Jennifer and Michael, which is her husband, new husband, said they're going to be there. And I'm like, oh, you know, that was just like a, another gut punch, right? It was a thing I've been trying to avoid and trying to negotiate with myself as to how I'm going to deal with this and how, well, what, how can I avoid the pain? How can I escape it, uh, put it off? And, um, you know, and I, I reached out to a couple people that I knew, including my brother, and got a couple different 
got counsel from several different people. And um, so I responded back with kind of a, well, you know, can I come a little later when the party's <laughs> over? You know, and they're gone and we'll just do more of a private kind of celebration. And my daughter-in-law said, wow, she says, you know, I was really counting on you to help decorate because I, <laughs> I had done that with the first grandson, right? And she says, you know, I, I, I'm going to be really disappointed if you're not here for the party and helping me to decorate. And, you know, I and I just I sat on it for like a couple of days and I prayed hard and and I went back to the scriptures and I'm like, Lord, what do I do? You know, what do I do in this situation? I'm just, you know, I'm struggling with this. I'm struggling with how do I deal with it? How do I respond? How do I? put myself in this situation how do i interact with these people especially her i could deal with i i, I already had figured out how to negotiate these situations with her but this new person in the mix was entirely unknown for me it was an entirely different experience and so um i thought about it and i thought about it and i thought about it and everybody was saying well you know just tell her that you're in a lot of pain and you know you're just not ready to deal with it and yeah ron thought, you know be, right? well, before you go there i want to i want to really point this part out because there's another piece to this story that i want the guys to hear if it's okay yeah. and that is that is that um this you work in the summer season non-stop seven hour seven days a week 12 15 what how many hours a day ron yeah 12 at least 10 to 12 and this is for six seven months five months six in a row. months yeah mm -hmm. And so, um, and, and you pour into the guys and change university, right? Yep. And so you kind of exit that season being a little bit exhausted and holidays come around. And when holidays come around in our, in our men's group, because for those of you that don't know, all of the senior coaches meet in men's group, just, just like all of you do, you, you start coming to men's group and you say, you know, guys, I'm just kind of exhausted. I'm just, and, and just things just aren't going so well. And we said, we encourage, remember what we encouraged you to do, Ron? Mm -hmm. Same thing we'd encourage these guys to do. What we encourage you to do? Um, get out and walk and, you know, get intentional with relationships again. And, love yourself. You know, love myself. Yeah. Basically love myself. Yeah. So, and so, so you were, you were kind of, kind of drained. You had started pouring into yourself. Then this thing comes up as another soul sucking opportunity, right? Yep. And so that, so I just wanted to make sure everybody understood that this was a very, 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 very difficult season for Ron already. And then this thing comes up and, and you kind of had to dig deep, right? Yeah, I really had to dig deep. And, um, and so I, I prayed on it and I waited several days before I even responded back and wrestled with it and, you know, I'd been reading about um, the Apostle Paul and how, how he talked so much about, you know, in his weakness, he found strength, right? Yeah. Um, and, I, and I was saying, this is where I'm at. I, I'm, I've got this, you know, there's just this weakness about what's going on here. I'm drained. I'm, I'm just feeling I, I don't have the energy to deal with it. I don't have the emotional capital to, to handle it. And I just cried out to the Lord. I said, Lord, I don't know. You know, I know I can't do it, but I know you can. And somehow I'm going to rely on you. I'm going to rely, I'm going to trust in you on this. I'm going to, I'm going to do what you, I'm going to be obedient. I'm going to be obedient. Uh, and I went into scripture and I went into, I think it talks about Matthew 20, 28, um, where Jesus says he did not come to be served but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for mm. any. And so I, I wrote back to my daughter and I can read you what I wrote. Um, I'd love to hear that. Yeah. So I wrote back to her because she said to me, I'm disappointed you won't be here for the party. I was looking forward to you helping me decorate again. And that was uh, on Friday. So on Sunday, Sunday night, so a couple of days have gone by, I'd wrestled with this for the whole weekend. I wrote back to her, I says, um, actually, this was the morning, excuse me, Sunday morning. I wrote back, good morning, Kristen. 
Uh, thank you for sharing your feelings of disappointment in how much you were looking forward to my assistance in decorating. Now, I have been emotionally wrestling with the deep pain that this divorce has created within my soul. I, I pray that the scars and wounds will heal, but I've come to realize that this is a long process. The journey has been long and very painful. I never realized how emotionally devastating divorce could be, and seeing this up front every day in the ministry work I do is a reminder to me how much I need the strength of Jesus in my weakness to overcome. Wow. I have been praying and seeking answers over the last several days about what to do in this situation. Jesus told his disciples in Matthew 20, 28, that he did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. I care deeply for all of you and also want to be an obedient servant for Jesus. Hmm. I will come over on Friday and it will be my pleasure to help you decorate and be part of this celebration. I want to ask for your forgiveness for only thinking about my own pain wow. and not and not focusing upon how I can love all of you better. Wow. Wow, Ron. I feel like since chills up my spine. See, guys, this is the this is Ron. This is who Ron is. He doesn't just ask you to do these things. This is who Ron is. Ron is a man who serves with all of his heart and soul. And he owned it. He said, thank you for sharing your feelings. He owned it. And he said, I would be honored to go serve you. Ron, wow, Ron. That, that is, that, that, those that, you, that know Ron close, those words represent Ron's soul. You let your soul, you bore your soul to honor your children and your family. Wow. Wow, yeah. guys. And it honors, and it honored Christ too. And right? honoring Christ, yes. Yeah. And that was, that was what I wanted to convey is that, because they're not believers, um, and, I, and I wanted them to know that I'm, I'm doing this in the strength of Christ. Yeah. Yeah. And well, so I, fast, share, I fast. shared that. I shared this too with my my brother, right? Because mm -hmm. he, he was like, "Well, what did you decide to do?" And I said, "Well, we're just going to share this with you." And uh, um, he reached out to me last night, and he said, "You know," he said, "I I was." He says, "I've got a Bible study, a discipleship group of men that I'm walking through some stuff." And he said, "I shared your story with my my guys." And he says, I read what you wrote here. And he says, two of my guys started weeping. Yeah. 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 It's powerful, Ron. So. Yeah. You, cho you, cho you chose to do the right thing, even though it was the hard thing. You chose to do the right thing, even though it was the hard thing. And see, I wanted everybody here. To, I wanted everybody in Change University to hear this, this part of the story. Because it is excruciatingly painful to do the right thing when you're in the middle of this. It is excruciatingly painful. But it's, it, won't, it doesn't end. It's going to be every, these decisions will be excruciatingly painful in your life. You will always have situations that are excruciatingly painful. And if you make decisions in those moments based on your emotion, which is what got you into this wreck, it won't end good. But if you do what Ron did, Ron, a man of integrity, a man who serves, Ron's unifying life principles, if you do what Ron did, a man who follows Christ, it's never wrong to do the right thing, even though it's hard. It was not an emotionally based decision, Ron, was it? It was a principle based decision. If it was your emotions, you probably would have been, well, <laughs> maybe finding some other forms of pain relief. Who knows? I, <laughs> right? You cho yeah, chose I to do. do the right thing because that was your principles. Yeah, it was a principle based decision. Um, and it was, it was funny because two of the two of the people I talked to were both one was an ex pastor and then my brother's an associate pastor and both are kind of giving me the easy the easier way out right yes yes be uh, careful who you listen to right oh yeah they're both giving me the easier way out and you know I just 
I went back to scripture, right? I went back to, to what Jesus said. Um, and that was what my brother said last night. He goes, he goes, he, my brother said to me, he says, I was praying that this would be your answer, but I didn't know if you could do it. Um, he said, I prayed that this would be your, your choice. And he said, when you sent that to me, I was like, thank you, Jesus, for answered prayer. Um, and, you know, he, he talked to his guys about, he says there was an object lesson that he used it for his, his Bible study with his men. And he said, my brother, he says, my brother, instead of doing emotions, went to scripture. And he went and followed Jesus. Well, so let's talk about that weekend. How did it go, Ron? How did that well, weekend go? You know, it was it was interesting. It was I I just, you know, I said to myself, I'm gonna be gracious. Um, I'm gonna show grace. I'm gonna, you know, engage with this man. I'm gonna talk to him. Uh, I'm gonna make him feel comfortable to be there. Um, because I felt that. You know, this was part of honoring my daughter-in-law and son, and I wanted to make sure that my ex did not have any reason to say we didn't feel welcome, you know, so we're not going to come back. You know, I, I just want to take any excuses away, you know, that she might have in the future. So, and, you know, the rest of the weekend was just blessed in so many ways. In fact, my son came in to me and Saturday was really hectic day because my three-year-old is sitting there watching his one-year-old brother open all these gifts and he's thinking it's his birthday too right and so there's a little bit of this henry that's not your gift it's luke's and you know luke will let you share it but you know so it was a lot of negotiating and and i thought you know everything in henry would be so focused around all the activity that that would be the highlight of his day and my son actually talked to my oldest grandson at the end of the day. And he goes, well, Henry, what was the best part of today? And Henry said, grandpa Ron. <laughs> Wasn't what I expected. Right. Last thing I would have thought was would I heard my three-year-old grandson that the best part of the day was, was being with me. And what I had done is I had engaged with him during the whole party thing, you know, I was there down the floor interacting with him and Luke, his younger brother, and, you know, just being involved. And the whole time my ex and her new husband are just sitting on the couch, completely disengaged. And, and I think that that's what Henry remembered is that I was engaged with him, you know, being involved in his life. Um, and my, my, wife had made the choice not to be involved for the last year right so the grandsons didn't know her they didn't have a relationship with her um not that i'm trying to you know dishonor her but those were her choices yeah right? um and so the rest of the weekend was just i mean it was blessing they were blessed in so many ways we we took a trip down went on a christmas train ride with the, the grandkids me and my son and daughter-in-law we did a uh, there's a huge light show that they do down in uh, called Spanaway Park, which is just amazing. We just, that was just spectacular. I mean, it was such a memorable experience that I, I'm going to talk to my son about coming over every year. We're going to do this as a tradition. There right? you go, Ron. Yeah. So, you know, with the grandkids and us, we're all going to go and do this as a family tradition because it was just, it was spectacular. Um, and Henry just, I mean, he just lit up. Uh, about all that so the whole weekend you know was so blessed afterwards and you know and it was just like jesus said if you you know if you're obedient the blessings come right yes yes we go back to deuteronomy and and i got you know i got to see a, a firsthand example of god show up in you know several different ways you know he gave me strength to get through this and then he also blessed me because of the obedience and it's just like I came home, driving home, and I was just so grateful, so thankful for uh, being obedient and doing doing the hard stuff, doing the right stuff, um, making those making those decisions. You see, you see, Ron, it, this is this is so awesome because it it brings the story full circle. You see, in the very very beginning of this story, 
you said you made a decision to stand on the line so that you could be an example to your sons of, to do the right thing, even though it's hard. Yep. Right. And here you tell me that the same exact decision, your unifying life principles of doing the right thing, even though it's hard, come back to bear. Cause if you're, if you'd let your emotions go six years ago, where you'd probably be divorced two more times by now. Right. Probably. But the principle-based decision, here you are, and now your grandchildren are seeing the fruits of your decision to do the hard thing, even though it's wrong. And after that weekend, how did, before the weekend, you felt, you know, it was anxious and until you, until you made the decision, how'd you feel after the weekend? Euphoric, right? Well, I felt this huge peace, right? Um, I was like, wow, if I can face this, I can face anything. Yeah. And I was just thinking about this. We were talking about my book and I think everybody's got it, but I, there's this little diagram on page 52 that I want to encourage everybody to, to pull up and have a little look at. And we go over this very briefly in Change University. It's your unifying life principles. But this is what Ron did. You see, on, on this path is, a, is, a, is um, emotional-based decisions. And if you happen to make the right decision, it makes you feel better. And if you have to make the work, wrong decision it makes you feel worse but here's the path of unifying life principle decisions right it's never wrong to do the right thing because when you do the right thing you will feel, feel better maybe not when you're doing it right ron yeah not when you're doing it but afterwards listen to what happened after because you made a principle-based decision right very 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 powerful very powerful Guys, we teach you this stuff. Ron's senior coach overseeing many, many of you guys. He's the real deal. This is the real deal. He's even Ron has struggles. Yeah, he does. But he, in the moment, made this decision based on principle. And I just wanted to highlight this for everybody. I think, Ron, if we can take just a couple of minutes here and open it up, let the guys ask some questions of you. And yeah, I just want to say thank you. I mean, that was just wow. Talk about soul inspiring uplifting image of what it means to do the right thing it's hard awesome. it's hard guys it's hard to do the right thing but it's you know we we talk about and, and i i know i preach this to you guys too about it's never wrong to do the right thing and you know i was like i was i convicted myself you know i'm like you know I, this is what i teach this is what i tell you guys to do this is what i need to do right I need to do the, I need to do the, the hard thing, the right thing, uh, and trust God, you know, just be faithful, faithful in strength, faithful in your weakness. Just be faithful. Right. Wow. Wow. Well, guys, let's open this up for some questions and comments. Anybody, anybody have any questions or comments for Ron here while we're, we're online. That's awesome. 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 And I can't tell if you're raising your hand or whatever. So feel free to come off of, uh, feel free to come off mute and comment or ask questions if you'd like. I think they're hey, dead. Ron, that's a great <laughs> story. Um, and to always hear that even those that have gone before you still struggle with that stuff, it's, uh, it's encouraging. Um, you know, just, uh, on my end, even just hearing from the kids about the guys that are coming through, it's, it's difficult. Um, but you're a great example, um, to just continue to, well, I mean, you taught me from the start, you know, uh, the Bible says that, that if at all possible, live at peace with people. Yep. And, um, uh, a funny thing is my lawyer actually quoted that to me as well at the beginning of all this. And, and so I've really kind of tried to stay that way. I know there are some times in my process that it didn't go that well, but, but you've been a great example to me on that. So I, I appreciate you leading my example here as well and sharing uh, that event as well with all of us. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, in fact, funny that you mentioned that, that scripture, that was also one of the ones that I had uh, reflected and meditated on was as much as it's possible to be at peace with everyone, you know, that was another thing that drove me to, 
you know, not only serve, but to, but then to engage with this man and have a conversation with them. And, you know, and the Holy Spirit actually put on my heart, you know, said that, you know, maybe this man really isn't saved. Maybe, maybe there'll be another conversation down the road where, you know, I can actually share the gospel with him and, and in a, in a way that's really brings honor to Jesus. Right. Yeah. Not that I'm ready to do it at this point, because we don't have that kind of connection, but, you know, we, I thought we had a good start, you know, at least we're able to sit across the table and eat some food and just kind of just generally chit chat. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So let me share just a, something here just to kind of for, for the guys to think about. Um, so we have seen a lot of men and golly, nearly three and a half years of change university come and we've seen a lot of men go. And pretty much without fail, when the wife comes back, the men go, is that right? Because they think that everything's going to be great. Everything's going to be perfect. Now that my wife's back, I, I don't have to have a men's group. I don't have to do the things that got me better. I can just go be with my wife and things are fine. And how many times, actually, how many times have we, have we ever seen that succeed? No. Not, to my, not, not to my knowledge. I think we've seen it fail time and time and time and time and time again, haven't we? Because they don't choose to do the things that got them stable and healthy when they came here. They don't put themselves in men's group. They don't keep going to church. They don't apply their unifying life principles, right? They do the same things that got them there. And one of the things I wanted to highlight here is, guys, this is change university introduces you to principles that you have to decide to apply every single day of your life for the rest of your life. And if you do, your life will be unlike anything that you can possibly imagine. If you don't, that can be so pretty, right? So any other comments or encouragement for Ron here with our last little bit? Ron, it's good to hear that you're human, mm. and I'm, I'm glad glad to hear your story and the strength and what's rubbing off on me where it came from. Uh, I like that. Thank you. Thanks for that story. Yeah, you're welcome. I I didn't realize it was going to be as impactful until David and I were talking about it, and uh, and then my brother, what he shared with me um, yesterday. I mean, he just called me up and goes. And he says, two of my guys in my group are weeping. You know, they they heard that story and they were like, you know, my brother was like, see, I keep telling you guys, you know, you got to have principles. You got to go back to the scripture. You got to have, you got to have a foundation for what you're doing in your lives. Um, and I'm like, you said that to him? And he goes, yeah. I'm like, yeah. Do you want to be a coach and change university? <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> for sure. Who else? Comments or questions for Ron? Don't be shy. Hey, Damon. Listening to Ron's weekend and his story reminds me he did, he did exactly what Christ's invitation was from Matthew 16, 24. Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their own cross and follow me. Yes. And I think that was a great, that it is an example of what Ron did. Thank you, Henry. Thanks, yeah. Henry. Who else? Don't be shy, guys. Ron, thank you for sharing your story. Um, it it just 
you know, solidifies that, yes, this is a long process. And, and there's still going to be days where, where we get caught off guard. We get, we get a twinge of pain that happened to me today. And I, I was folding laundry. Uh, I was just doing a quick load of laundry in the truck stop and I'm folding my pants and my wife used to do my laundry for me, you know, when I come off the road or before I went on the road. And I just thought, I'm like, why am I divorced? And And about as quick as that thought come to mind, it, I was flooded with thoughts of, of all the, the people that are standing next to me and behind me that are, have encouraged me over the last six months and the lessons that I've learned. And that... I should be, you know, we should all be proud of, of the work that we're doing. Yes. Oh, there's yes. still going to be days where we have to, where we have to call on, on the Lord for some additional strength. And mm-hmm. in the last two days, um, I've had Habakkuk from another driver that didn't know my situation. And then today the scripture of the day was, um, was brought up. And so I read Habakkuk today. And, but I just wanted to thank you for your example. You're welcome, Anthony. Thank you. Um, you know, I think the, the takeaway from all this is, guys, it is a lifelong process. I mean, I'm that many years down the road on this, right? Um, and you're going to face these challenges. Um, you know, if your wife, if you've got kids and your wives remarry, you're going to be put in that situation and you, know, you have to make choices and you choose what you get. Right. Um, we listened to a, a seminar a week ago, a couple weeks ago, John Maxwell and another guy, and they were talking about you choose what you get. Um, sometimes you got to choose the hard stuff to get the right stuff. Yeah. I, and and we, we can we can go in a group of time, can't we? I think everybody's here. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, uh, gee, the, I think that the, the other thing that I want to really highlight here is, um, you, if I, if, if you want to know who you're going to be in five years, look at the people that you spend time with, the books that you read, the things that you pour into yourself, right? Ron, in your story, I couldn't, I, countless times I reached out to people that I trust. I talked to him. I reached out to my brother who I trust. I talked to him. I read the scripture. I listened to podcasts. I prayed. And what occurred to me after, after you did that is if you hadn't made the decision to pour the scripture into yourself and to pour your, surround yourself with these pe- people and these people, these other people that come to you and said, you know, Ron, I think you should just, Give her the middle finger and say, screw it. Because she deserves it, dude. She deserves it. Give her the middle finger, right? Sorry for being crass, but 99 out of 100 people probably would have said that. Honestly. But the people that you associate with, right? And the people that you get counsel from, mainly the guy upstairs, because of how you poured into yourself, right? It comes to you. The thing, my, my point is, this stuff comes when when this stuff comes to you naturally because you are different than you used to be. In times of crisis, you don't revert because you have made it part of your DNA because you've surrounded yourself with people, you've soaked in the word, you've soaked in, and it becomes part of your DNA. So that when the difficult decisions come up, you're able to make the difficult decision, even though it's the hard decision, but the right decision. If you hadn't done, if you don't do this hard stuff, then those hard decisions won't be, you won't be able to make those hard decisions. Yeah, I, I agree. I, and it's, you got to really, the key, I think is the lesson for me is you got to invest in yourself. Yes. Uh, love yourself. Love yourself. Watch what you take into your system. Really watch what's going into your system. What's going into your mind. You know, Paul talks about, 
you know, renewing of your mind, right? Do not conform to the pattern of this world. And it's just, you know, like, like I said, six, seven years ago, I just turned off the TV, you know? Um, I might turn on once in a great while to watch a football game, but that's about it. You know, it's just, I, I just said, what is, what do I have coming into my system and what is feeding me and what's not feeding me? And, yeah. uh, you know, and I think you got to make some of those hard decisions. And I, and I read books, you know, Tony Dungy and some other guys that, you know, that I've guys I've come across and stuff I've read, you know, they've talked about, they talk about that. They talk about spiritual disciplines and uh, habits and, you know, what you take into your system is going to change who you are. Um, and we talk about, you know, wisdom of many counselors, but your counselors are more than just the guys around you too, right? When you pick up a book by, you know, someone that's a godly man, that's a counselor for you. Yes. Oh, yes. Right? Yeah. When you, look, when you listen to a sermon from a guy like, you know, John MacArthur or Alistair Begg or, you know, some of the really strong biblical preachers out there, that's another counselor, you know? So don't just think that your counselors are just the guys in front of you. You know, your counselors are a wide spectrum of, of resources. Um, and that's what, that's what I tried to kind of teach my coaches and training, you know, is make sure you plug into, you know, sound counselors, right? Because that's going to be important for your growth because that's what I've done and I've seen the fruit of it. Uh, so, yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Daniel, I saw you were going to say something earlier. I was just going to say, Ron, thank you for sharing your testimony. Um, you know, I, give, I get to give you feedback every couple of weeks, and, but to continue to see your journey with your, your sons and your grandsons and to continue hearing the story on how it continues to evolve. And, it, it, you know, it, it's continuing. Um, to, it's, it's the next step, next step, next phase for you. Um, and to see the impact, I guess what I guess what tonight what touched me the most was your grandson's response about the best time, what he remembered of that day. That just goes back to, for me knowing because you know for the, how long now for the past you know a couple of years now we've been you've been hearing you know this journey you on with your sons and your grandson, and now you get your new grandson uh, uh, from this year. Just to, to see that, to see where it's come to today, and to sharing that story today, um, it, it's just been an honor and a privilege and a blessing to just be a you know, just be able to be part of that and and um, to see that growth in you and that growth in your in your family. So thank you for sharing. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, that that really surprised me. I wasn't expecting that. And, and my son just he came in. He says, "You know what Henry told me?" And I go, "No." He goes, "I I just asked him." And he said, the best part of the day was, was being with you. And I'm like, what? I mean, he had all these gifts he's opening up. I mean, wow. he was like a brother, you know, he, he, all the stuff was going on. And, and he singled this particular time with me as the thing that was most important. Um, and that was, that was a God thing. You know I mean? That was God just showing up and saying, you know, you've been obedient. And I'm going to bless you with this. And it was, a, I mean, I didn't expect, it. I was just, I was blown away. Hey, Mike, I see you've, yeah, go for it, buddy. Yeah, yeah I just wanted to, just wanted to, uh, I guess, confirm, I guess, I, I don't even know what the word would be. The, the unplugging, you know, that you said, Ron, it, that really resonated with me because when I, when I prayed and prayed before all the craziness went down in my marriage, you know, I asked God, Hey, teach me how to be a godly husband. Teach me how to be a godly father. I, I, I didn't have this growing up and I don't know what I'm doing. And, you know, I just started open Genesis and God's, you know, word started to talk to me. Mm -hmm. And I mean, literally I got halfway through Genesis and I quit watching Netflix. I drive trucks. So, you know, I'm out on the road. I, I quit watching Netflix. I quit watching everything. I got rid of TV. I got rid of Facebook. You know, I, I opened a second little 
thing just for the messenger group and that was it. And, and I have to say, you know, I, I've told other guys who are going through some hard times, maybe not necessarily what we're all going through or have been through, but hard times that I'm like, man, unplug, unplug, because like you said, it's just nonsense out there. And it's just, you know, I, and it was funny because everybody asked me when I did it, you know, why, and, and, I, I didn't use the same reason you did of there, you know, I'm already got enough going on. I don't need any more, you know, bad stuff, but I, I just was like, no, it's getting in the way of me and God, you know, it's getting in the way of before I know it, I'm flipping through Facebook for two hours trying to catch up from the last day or two. And I didn't read one scripture and it's right. like that, that's not a good thing. So I, I'm just, it's great to hear somebody else like affirm that and, and, and really, stand behind that because that i don't know that for me was the most important part in the beginning so but thanks again for sharing all that that's really cool to hear that man because that's it just proofs in the pudding right well it goes back to what paul said in philippians 4 8 right he said to what finally brothers and sisters whatever is true whatever is noble whatever is right whatever is pure whatever is lovely whatever is admirable if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things, right? I didn't know I was applying that scripture in my life when I made these decisions, right? I just knew intuitively that I needed to do these things. I needed to be in a men's group. I needed to be in the word. I needed to turn off the, the crap coming through the TV system that was not noble, was not right, was not pure, was not lovely, right? I, you know, and then when I later on, when I read the scripture, I'm going, oh, OK, God, that's what I'm doing. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, anybody else before we let you guys go to group? All right. Well, then, Ron, I just want to affirm you. You are an incredible example. You've had an impact on so many people's lives because of your choices. So many people's lives. You've been such an encouragement to me and all these guys. And you know, you'll know a tree by its fruit. <laughs> and your fruit is pretty abundant because of your choices. And it all stems back. I think it all stems back for, from the original choice, right? Your why was pretty clear. I'm going to do the right thing so that my sons can see a man doing the right thing, even though it's hard. Yeah. And see, I guess if, if I were to close this talk for everybody here, I would close it at that. And that is that um, you didn't stand on the right, you didn't stand on the line of reconciliation so that you could get your wife back. And when your wife didn't come back, you went ahead and found another wife. No. Nope. Right. That wasn't your why. Your why was so that they could see you doing the right thing, even though it was hard. And guys, if your why, I hate to say this, but if your why for being here is so that is only so that you can get your wife back, many of you are really setting yourself up for failure. You've got to have a deeper why. You've got to have a vision that your children will not experience this pain, that your grandchildren, see your grandchildren will not experience. You've got to have a vision bigger than that. And I know how difficult it is, right? But if your vision is, is I'm gonna do this until I get my wife back, you're gonna get the same re results that pretty much every single man that got their wife back got. Yep. You got to do this because you want to become the man that God created you to be so that you can be an example for everybody in your life, for your children first, for your grandchildren, for your unborn great-grandchildren, right? Make sure you have a big why because life is tough. It doesn't stop being tough, Ron, does it? Life is tough. No, you've got to look at, I, I think the, Someone asked me one, one time what it is, what my why was. And I said, and I think I wrote that to you, Damon, the other night. I said, my why has always been about the legacy, right? My sons, my sons saw a grandfather, my, my dad, grandfather, who didn't stand in line, who left you know, his wife and uh, led a pretty uh, 
disorganized, chaotic life afterwards. And that's what they saw. And I'm like, I am not going to leave that as the legacy that my sons see, right? Uh, I don't want them, I want them to see something that's entirely different. You've done it, Ron. You've done it. Wow. Let me close this in prayer. Father, thank you for Ron. Thank you for exa his example. Thank you for the fruit. It is so abundant. Father, thank you for the impact on the, all of the men here, all of the coaches in training, Father, all of the people in the, in the Fighting for Your Family group, and all the people that aren't here, just his, his kids, his grandkids, his great-grandchildren, kids. Father, thank you for that difficult decision to do the right thing, even though it was the hard thing. And thank you for the fruit that keeps coming because of that hard decision. I pray that tonight's talk convicted the men on this call that need to be convicted, convicted the men that will hear this in the future, that they'll be convicted. Father, help them make the decision to do the right thing, even though it's hard. Help them to reach out to the men that are here, to their coaches in training, to their coaches when they are struggling so they can get the advice that they need to hear. Maybe not the advice they want to hear, but the advice that they need to hear so that they can have the impact, much like Ron is having. And I pray all this in your name. Amen. 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 Thank you, Ron. Yeah. Thanks, David.